When you buy something, do you ever really ask yourself how it's made? Well, usually it's what you might expect. Think about it, you have 12 minutes for lunch, so you buy yourself a ham sandwich. The bread is made by this guy with a moustache that you know, so that's great. It looks and feels good, and yes, the packaging is soft to the touch. Inside, there's a slice of ham, which is from a pig, which comes from a farm. Uh, hang on, uh, which farm? In fact, that's not a question you ever ask, and you only have six minutes left to eat lunch. Another case, you have a sudden desire to buy clothes for young Luke and Maggie. You rush to the kids' clothes store, which you know and trust. After all, it says the shorts, the t-shirt and the skirt were made in an ethical manner. The fair trade code was respected, no underage workers and proper pay, decent hours. You believe it, of course. Now, if you were told that the very nice clothes for 12-year-old Luke and Maggie were made by children the same age, that live and work in terrible conditions 72 hours a week and for just $45 a month, well, you'd find it hard to believe, wouldn't you? You can react in two different ways. One, you could say, great, the little kid on the other side of the world is lucky, he's already found a job. Or you could think, hmm, that brand has violated every international law and has maybe slightly taken advantage of my trust. It was fun. It was exciting. An unforgettable experience. Like you, at Cash, we went for the second option. Have you noticed how the price of clothing has fallen? These days, you can buy clothes for the winter, for spring, for all the seasons without taking out an overdraft. There seem to be plenty of these low-cost outlets. According to France's Fashion Institute, the price of women's ready-to-wear clothing has fallen 13% in the past 10 years. For many years, the world's workshop where these cheap clothes were made has been China, of course. But now Chinese workers are demanding better pay and conditions, so Western brands have been looking elsewhere. Such as Bangladesh, on the Indian subcontinent, which in just a few years has become the second biggest exporter of clothes to much of Europe. Made in Bangladesh seems to be in full fashion. It's the weekend, the perfect time for a quick shopping expedition in Europe's new backstreet supply. According to the country's tourist office, this is what Bangladesh is like. Contented workers picking the tea crops. At night, musicians serenade visitors to the sound of their ektaras, a sort of one-string guitar. The people lead a blissful life. The kids spend their days flying kites on wonderful beaches, an earthly paradise. Welcome to beautiful Bangladesh. In fact, nothing in the ad resembles real life in the country, which is some 7,000 kilometers from Europe. 15 million souls are packed into Dakar, the capital city, a highly polluted megalopolis with the highest population density in the world. Bangladesh is also one of the poorest countries in the world, where the slum kids are more likely to play on wasteland than sandy beaches. Approximately half of the 152 million people that live in the country survive on less than $1.50 a day. The labor force is incredibly cheap, ideal for the textile industry, and an industry that now accounts for 80% of all of Bangladesh's exports. Every day, 3.6 million workers sew and stitch on an endless assembly line. The labor here is largely female. To find the textile plants in Dakar, just follow your nose to the dusty tiles over several floors below, straight lines of neon lighting. Officially, there are 4,000 such buildings scattered across the city. In truth, there are probably twice that number. But getting into these workshops where the labor force is often locked in during working hours is no easy matter. In recent years, journalists who've tried have been expelled out of hand. So throughout our inquiry, we pass ourselves off as potential buyers. We also need a good guide. And the one we have has been in the textile business for more than a decade. 
He heads up a company that inspects suppliers, making sure they respect employment laws. Our fixer doesn't mind being filmed, but prefers to use an alias while we're in country. My name's Munir. Don't forget, huh? I use that name when I'm working. You see, I have no bodyguards, uh, which is why I use another name. And thanks to Munir, the doors open before us. Sorry? Maybe 12 pieces. $1.8. No, 18 dollars. Here are the changing rooms of textile globalization. Here's a brand, do you know this one? So this is where IKEA goes shopping to dress its employees. And in another workshop, this one is Sarah. We'll come back to this one soon. In the meanwhile, here's a pair of shorts for men from Zara's rival, H&M. After 48 hours, we head to North Dakar. With a hidden camera and still pretending to be buyers, we continue our little charade. A foreman holds up several samples. He offers us a pair of striped shorts for women. Everyone in France knows Monoprix. They're all over the country. It's one of the most popular stores in French cities, with a good reputation. Its website proudly claims a million visitors to its stores every day. Selling everything from organic vegetables to the latest fashions for men, women, kids and babies. It's a family store and it inspires confidence in its products. In Dakar, the owners of this factory that supplies Monoprix welcome us to their office. Nice to meet you. We still have our hidden camera. On the hangers, more products destined for Monoprix. Can I have a look? Yes? Yeah, great. Yeah, Monoprix too. This is a woman bread from Monoprix. Yeah. Boutchou, yeah, not this one too. The Monoprix Boudouchou line is for babies. This is from this year? Yes. This year collection? Okay. Yeah, this is all Monoprix, in fact. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I see Monoprix is, is really a big customer of you. Wood de Choux, yeah. CFK, or Treton, all three Monoprix clothing brands. And this manager seems to be responsible for French clients. He's proud to count Monoprix as one of his loyal customers, a very loyal customer. We are working for Monoprix last nine years. Nine years, okay. So this is a big customer for you, yeah. Because all the year we are working for them. So you must be a good a good factory. If every year they come back to you. If we are good, then we are good. Yeah, yeah, okay. You can't say we are good. Because yeah. we have no compliance. We are supporting Monoprix almost uh, half of their volume in Bangladesh. They trust us completely and even allow us to openly film as part of our commercial visit. Yeah, no okay, more hidden camera. Okay, yeah. Ladies, pay good attention. Here, exclusively for you, the Monoprix Spring Summer Collection, including these magnificent striped trousers, coming to a Monoprix store near you in just a month's time for only 30 euros. I'm showing you another one. Yeah. And yes, this one too is already available back in France, also for 30 euros. Really very reasonable indeed. <laughs> Now let's get serious and get to the workshop itself. The buyers we pretend to be want to check up on the quality. What we really want to see are the working conditions for the 1,100 people that toil in this factory. On the second floor, three rows are working exclusively on Monoprix's new children's collection. According to the managers, the French company has never had anything to complain about because here, dear lady, the working hours are respected, you know. Eight. Eight to five. Eight to five. Okay. Okay. Eight, eight to five. Another two. Another two. Watch this overtime. Okay. In other words, 
a 60 hour long work week, in line with local practice. We too are fulfilling our own work practices and record the faces of all these conscientious dressmakers. This one, for example, or that one. We wonder how old they are. Are these girls 18, the minimum age required by Bangladeshi law to work a 60 hour week? Or are they 14, which is legally when you can start work here, but only for 36 hours a week? What do you think? Not easy to judge, is it? In Bangladesh, the law is quite clear. No one under the age of 14 is allowed to work in a factory. We would have liked to ask this very young-looking girl her age, but as buyers, we're not allowed to speak to the staff. And it's too delicate a question to ask the managers, who never leave our side for more than a second. Actually, take a look at the back to the left. It's our guardian angel in the blue and white checked shirt, staring straight into our camera. We'll see him again. That evening, we are politely escorted to our cars. No, it's OK. Don't worry. Uh, you A few days later, we're back at the Monoprix factory. Inside, the lights mean everyone is still working full time. It's almost 8 p.m. Ten minutes later, the first of the staff begins to leave. Even allowing for overtime, they should have left work at least an hour earlier. It's a 45-minute walk to reach what passes for home the Bashantek slums. Dark alleyways, sheet metal huts, typical of almost any shanty town. 20,000 people live here, all of them below the poverty line. Munir, our guide, tracked down several employees of the Monoprix factory here. Come here, join us. Under the white veil is Aki. Hello. Ami? Marie. I'm Aki. Aki? Yes. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Do you recognize them? Do you recognize them? Did you see them in the factory? Yes. 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 She remembers us then. <laughs> Aki has been working at the factory for about a year and a half to be able to afford her pitiful, barely lit shack, which she shares with her mother. We set about asking Aki the questions that have been nagging us. How old is she? 17. She'll be 17 soon. Aki is certainly old enough to work, but are the employment laws respected for a minor like herself? What time did you start work this morning? 8 o'clock. And finished at? 8 p.m. How many days a week? Six days a week. Six days out of seven, 12 hours a day. Aki works, therefore, for 72 hours a week, twice the time legally stipulated and in complete disregard of national and international law. To make sure that Aki really does work in the Monoprix factory, we show her the video we filmed in her workplace. Does she recognize that model there? You see this? Do you recognize this? Oh, yes, that's on production line B or C. And did Aki work on the checkered shorts for babies that we saw in her boss's office? Recognize this? Yes. What did you make? Oh, I worked on the stitching. Our visit begins to attract more and more of the locals. Buyers with a camera visiting female workers in the middle of a slum. Suspicious. A man appears out of the darkness and intervenes. Go on, tell them that working conditions inside the factory are good. As Munir says, the man has come from the factory. 
He looks like our guardian angel, remember? The guy in the blue check shirt. And here he is, in the young girl's room. How did they know we were here? By telephone. So, we may have some problems with this guy. The man's insistent presence curtails our visit. To protect Aki and her mother, we decide to leave. Our search for other factory workers continues in the slums' bazaars. At the bend of this alleyway, we have another meeting scheduled. In green and blue, this is Khadija. Behind her is her friend, Sharmin. They are neighbors, both in the slum and at work. Yes, the same factory as Aki, the monoprix factory. This time, following behind Khadija's slight shadow, we don't waste time asking what we consider to be the question. How old are you? I'm 14 years old. 14? I think you're 12 or 13. All right, I'm 12. In fact, Khadija doesn't know if she's 12, 13 or 14. She has no birth certificate. And in Bangladesh, that's common. Registering births only became obligatory in 2004. Conversation continues in Khadija's home. A makeshift roof, rickety walls. The year before, she abandoned the schoolroom to begin working to afford this shack in which she lives with her parents, who are too ill to work. Since then, Khadija, the Bashantek slum girl, has been clocking on at the textile plant like an adult. What time do you start work? Duty. At the factory? Eight o'clock. And you finish at? I finish at eight at night. Okay. Okay, and for how many days? I work six days a week. So that's at least 72 hours a week. And sometimes it's seven days a week, as her work card shows. And it's all for the sake of making clothes for Monoprix. So? Does she know this? Have you worked on any other of the brand's clothes? Yes, some others. What other models have they worked on for the same brand? Well, what did they do, for example? Other trousers and shorts, things like that? And that was when? That was before? Yes. How long ago? A month? No, not a month. Uh, two weeks? I recognize that. We worked on those, too. They made these. I'm sad because I can't go to school and play with the other girls. Working at the factory is like being in prison. But I have to. My parents are poor. It would have been okay if this had been a nightmare. That in truth, it was just a bad dream that girls like this are forced by poverty to work like the adults on behalf of a store that a million people a day flock to in France. And the thing is that charters exist in France that are meant to stop this sort of thing from happening. Including one signed by the largest French stores of which Monoprix was one. Yes, indeed. It's known as the SCI, the Social Clause Initiative, and dates back to 1998. Texts that clash uncomfortably with reality. What they can do for us is to give us an interview. We had asked to talk with management on the subject of child labor at their largest supplier in Bangladesh. Three weeks later, Cécile Cloarec, Monoprix's Director of Human Resources, Communication and Sustainable Development, agrees to see us. Let's start. We've just come back from Bangladesh and we investigated a factory that works for you over there, the Chittagong Fashion Millennium Textile Limited. Have you been there? Has anyone from Monoprix ever been to Bangladesh, in fact? 
Le groupe Monoprix va sur place au Bangladesh. Monoprix nous has indeed been to Bangladesh. Que nous envoyons, We send our vont, euh, textile experts there, and it's up to them to talk with the suppliers about the quality of the product, so it's not their responsibility to check on the social aspects of how the factories are run. Uh, you've made some very serious statements, and if these are proved true, well, let me assure you that they would be unacceptable to Monoprix. They would go against the values and rules we believe in, and against the principles we have asked our suppliers to guarantee. Now, we were shocked by the conditions of the workforce that produces clothes for the Monoprix Group and the conditions concerning their workouts. How can you explain that the Monoprix Group has been working with the same factory for nine years? And why should we, from the cash production company, have to be the ones to inform you? You should have been aware of this a long time ago. We have been working with this factory for several years, and they signed an ethical contract. But they ignore it. Well, apparently, at least in as far as you claim, the facts seem to be very serious, and if true, would indicate they are indeed not respecting our contract. Uh, we're treating this matter that you have brought to our attention with the utmost urgency. We have immediately stopped production at the factory, and we've launched an audit to find out what is happening there. So it's a getting to the root of the problem, finding out who is responsible and taking the necessary measures. Let me give you some of the details. On the ground. There's Aki, who is a 17-year-old girl who's been working for more than a year in the factory that produces clothes for the Monoprix group. It means she was just under 16 when she began working, specifically on these checkered shorts that we brought back from Bangladesh, and we're certain she helped produce these. It's a pair of shorts for the kids' line, and the label is here, and you can see clearly that it was made for your company. Do you think it's acceptable that a 16-year-old girl working in this factory for 72 hours a week to produce clothes which are sold in your stores and that we buy. Let me be clear, it's absolutely not acceptable and completely contrary to what Monoprix demands of its suppliers. Yes, but to be honest, it's also unacceptable that we are the ones that have to inform you about this. But let me be quite clear, and I think it's important that the people that watch this report understand that these products will not be on our shelves. Oh, so you're withdrawing them then? Production has been stopped. But you're pulling them off the shelves? Yes, obviously they'll be withdrawn. I'm going to show you the face, actually, of a young girl, a very young girl. Her name is Khadija. And this is now clearly child labor, as this young girl no longer attends a school and works in a factory that produces the clothes for Monoprix. All I can say is that this video, her face, are, in, in fact, they're totally unacceptable. Our audit will include checks on all the personnel files. But objectively, when we present you with the facts like these, are you shocked? Are you scandalized? What? It's not a matter of being shocked or not. The issue is how we go forward from here and how a European company can work with a supplier to ensure it complies with acceptable standards. In witness the whereof, Monoprix formally undertakes to reinforce its controls on suppliers, a question of honour and, above all, reputation. In Bangladesh, the textile industry can go further still and play with the lives of its employees. A few days before we were due to leave, a young girl called Sarah comes to warn us. She volunteers for a local NGO and for several weeks has been investigating what could turn into a major health scandal in her country. <laughs> Following her lead, we take this sandy path to the source of the epidemic in the area of Savar, just outside Dhaka, the capital city. Workers, with their faces covered in dust, stand outside these discreet workshops. The cause of the contagion lies in the back of this hangar where they work, in the smallest room. Here, in the semi-darkness, in soaring temperatures, flitting shadows moving as if in a ballet from hell. They call them the Sandmen. With their homemade high-pressure hoses, they sandblast the raw denim jeans to give them that vintage look so popular the world over. The daily treatment involves 23 jeans an hour, 
12 hours a day. How long has this worker been employed here? Four years. Four years? OK. And how many sandmen are there exactly? 30. 30, huh? Here, the noise is unbearable and the atmosphere unbreathable. The sand that is everywhere is the worker's devious enemy. Pulverized against the canvas cloth, the particles seep through the men's thin scarves and settle in their lungs. They run the risk of silicosis, an incurable and fatal respiratory disease. It's the reason why sandblasting has been banned in the European Union and recently in Turkey, the world's third largest exporter of genes. 52 workers have already died of silicosis in Turkey and the lives of 1,200 others are also threatened. How many genes uh, they are able to produce every month? 500,000. 500,000, okay. To keep the men supplied, there's a gigantic sandcastle. We wanted to see just how dangerous this was. Where do they find it? It's sand. The experts say the sand is of poor quality and dangerous. More than two-thirds of it is made up of silica in crystalline form. It's a time bomb waiting to explode inside the workers' lungs. It's hard to imagine that multinational companies would permit such working conditions. And yet the precise aim of the high-pressure hoses reveals a well-known European brand, as the manager here explains. That's been yeah. sandblasted. Yeah. Is this for international yeah. market? International market. Okay. okay. International Which country? Lindex. Lindex. Yeah, yes, that, that's it, yeah. Sweden. Sweden. Swedish. Swedish, yeah. Okay. Lindex is a Swedish brand similar to H&M, but not as well known. There are 400 Lindex stores across Northern Europe. And its blonde, Scandinavian-looking goodwill ambassadors include the actress Reese Witherspoon and Gwyneth Paltrow, the muse of the latest spring-summer collection. I want to order the clothes for myself. Fans beware. The jeans made in this workshop are on sale at Lindex online for $39.95. And yet, a few clicks further, and the website claims it does not use sandblasting, and that it even formally banned its use for its products in December 2010. We trace back the Swedish company's route in Bangladesh until we track down one of its official suppliers, the Pioneer Group. It's one of Pioneer's factories that is also situated in the Jeans neighborhood of Dakar that has its Lindex products sandblasted at the workshop. We get in touch with the Swedish company and ask for an interview. After going around with them for three weeks, this is their final answer. They confirm they have completely banned the use of sandblasting. They inform us that after checking our reports, they can't say for sure whether the jeans in question are actually for sale in their stores. They thank us, however, and assure us they will take even tougher measures in the future to ensure the necessary controls are in place. Among the denim slave laborers of Dakar, the so-called gene epidemic is already claiming victims. Every week, Sarah, the NGO volunteer, spends several hours accompanying the sick to medical checkups. Dash, Hannah. Eight years of sandblasting has left his lungs in tatters. It's a bumpy 30-minute ride by rickshaw. But we finally, whoops, mind your head, arrive in one piece at the National Institute for Pulmonary Diseases. Oh, yeah. 
In the turquoise polo is Raihan, two years as a Sandman, and he's just one of 37 people Sarah's NGO has diagnosed as sick. Dr. Mustafa calls in all three. I'm a sandblaster. And do you have the same symptoms, the same problems as this man? Yes, I can't run, and when I try to walk quickly, I feel ill. I find it hard to climb stairs, too. Same work, same symptoms, same diagnosis. These two patients have got the same disease. Most likely due to exposure of the dust, silica. How, how are they exposed to this disease right now? By due to their uh, occupation. Due to their occupation. You see, there is some dot shadow. Yeah, at this little dot. So, yes. If they continue their jobs, yeah. then the lung will be infiltrated by this type of dust, and there will be okay. breathlessness. Okay. Then there will be deficiency of oxygen in our body. Then heart failure, respiratory failure, then heart failure. So they have to quit the job. This is important. Yes. Yeah. In 2014. Dr. Mustafa's surgery, the word silicosis has not been mentioned outright. But the poor state of Hanan and Raihan's lungs means they already have the illness's first symptoms. Not yet 30, the two men have only one choice if they want to live, quit their jobs. The doctor says you should stop working. What will you do? I'll take a week off. Are you allowed to? Yes, if I show my medical report signed by the doctor to my boss, I'm allowed seven days off. What are you more scared of? I'm afraid of having a serious illness. So why don't you just leave the job once and for all? I can't. That would create too many problems. I cannot leave the job because that would create a lot of problems. In one week, Hanan will, as he's done for the past eight years, sandblast jeans, a job that will slowly kill him. In journalists' jargon, it's known as a source, meaning one or several people who secretly provide information, possibly by means of a USB key. We naturally protect our sources, so as not to raise suspicions, let's just say the USB key suddenly appeared as if by miracle on our desk one morning. On it, there's a 20-page document, written in English. It concerns New Delhi in India and the textile industry. We soon realize this is a confidential audit on the production workshops. Fully illustrated, its findings are disturbing. The legal minimum salary is ignored in 76% of cases and child labor used by a quarter of manufacturers. It's dated September 2009 and was conducted by Inditex, a large organization whose name appears on every page. Inditex mean anything to you? No? And if we mention Zara? That sounds more familiar, doesn't it? Zara, a name that makes you want to go shopping, and in fact, statistics show on average everyone goes to Zara at least once every three weeks. It's one of Europe's favorite clothes stores, a paradise of chic, low-cost fashion. It was founded in Spain in 1975, and its success means that Inditex has grown into the planet's largest textile empire, with 5,527 boutiques around the world and brands which dress us all. Berkshire, Stradivarius, Oisho, and so on and so forth. In the back of this saloon is Amancio Ortega, the ultra-discreet founder of Inditex. 
a rare glimpse of the former dressing gown manufacturer and now possessor of the world's fifth largest fortune. His secret is to continually turn over stock and styles, a revolutionary commercial model that is now taught at Harvard Business School. It's called fast fashion. You're peckish? Go to a fast food outlet. You're in a shopping mood? Go to a Zara outlet. A new dress every two weeks, a new wardrobe every three months. At Zara, you can afford it. It's really not expensive at all. And it's profitable. Almost $2.5 billion in net profits for Inditex so far this year. But at what cost, exactly? The answer would seem to lie in the confidential document we obtained. The Inditex teams analyze the working conditions on their assembly lines in New Delhi. They mark their suppliers as a school teacher would his pupils. A is the highest mark given to those that respect all the ethical charters. The lowest is D for blatant breaches, such as child labor. And in 2009, the 24 official suppliers of Inditex in New Delhi were all failed. Each had a D. We also discover that in the shadows of the accredited suppliers, there exist an immense number of subcontractors, at least 2,000. An enormous network that casts its web all over the city. The document also includes video shot by the Inditex inspectors themselves to illustrate the deplorable conditions that exist among some of the subcontractors. The workshops are often dingy with electrical installations that are unsafe. Work is often carried out in cramped, unhygienic conditions. But the last video in the report shows why Inditex was keen to keep its audit secret. In this workshop, the employees sleep next to their sewing machines, or more exactly, on the floor below. Do they actually live here? How much do they earn? Come on, get up, get up. And how old are they? Less than 16, younger than 14 even. And another thing, how could the world's largest clothing group be part of this? We asked to speak with the director of Inditex France, but we are turned down. The company rarely gives interviews to the media. Plan B, go to Spain, the company's headquarters, and ask for an explanation from the boss himself. We roll up at this five-star hotel in Madrid, where the group's annual financial results are being presented at a press conference. It's one of the few occasions where the press can ask questions to Inditex management, and it attracts media from all over the world. <laughs> Suddenly, every camera is focused on Pablo Isla, the current president of Inditex and a key player in the company's success story. Isla looks radiant, as this year, once again, his group has performed exceptionally well. Good morning, everyone. Firstly, I'd like to thank our suppliers and their staff, who are able to keep up with our demand. I'd also like to thank our clients for the trust they have shown us. Pablo Isla is right to thank his suppliers as we have some questions we'd like to ask about them. A few questions from French TV next, and if you'd ask them in English, please. Uh, Inditex is a leading company, and we see it has committed itself worldwide for sustainability and, and corporate social responsibility, as well as uh, against uh, child labor and for the implementation of uh, uh, legal minimum wages. So could you confirm to us now that uh, no child works for Inditex? What I can tell you is that our work code forbids the employment of any child. 
If we are made aware of any supplier that employs children, well, let me assure you, we act immediately and with maximum authority. But uh, um, uh, we have actually evidence uh, with us here that there was a report that you're probably aware of uh, that actually says that um, uh, there are uh, children below 16, below 14, and, and they're working. And uh, we're wondering, um, we would like to know why these children actually work for Inditex. Is it just a lack of vigilance or is it just because the child is cheaper? I can guarantee you, uh, but let me say I find the tone of your question quite offensive, that's what I'd like to say first. Secondly, I can guarantee that Inditex doesn't tolerate any situation where children work and as soon as we discover this sort of situation among our suppliers, we act immediately. But sir, th this report it was in 2009 and apparently nothing was done about this. And uh, it clearly says in this report that Inditex uh, was aware of this. It's an audit, and there were f uh, 24 uh, companies, factories, that were audited in New Delhi. And it actually says in there that uh, no minimum wages are respected, and there is child labor as well. And, and those companies, they've kept working for, for Inditex. So I'm just wondering, um, is it a way to, when it comes to bringing costs lower, um, is there no limit anymore? Hey, listen, uh, this is not what this press conference is meant to be about. So please, leave us more information and we will get back to you. The tension is palpable, but Inditex promise they'll consider our request for an interview. In the meantime, we continue our investigation into the world's largest textile group. And by looking closely, we finally managed to unlock one of its most secret doors. Oh, the moonways. Come right in, boy. For the first time ever, and far from the confines of New Delhi, we're about to reveal another top secret document from the inner depths of the Inditex system. The document is in the form of a chart, a scale prepared by the company itself to evaluate its suppliers around the world. In the left-hand column are the criteria for which the factories that work for the company are judged. For example, if a supplier employs children or doesn't respect minimum salaries, it has penalized 76 points for each of these transgressions. The higher the final rating, the lower the supplier's rank. A is good and D is very poor. But line 18 of the chart contains Inditex's most closely guarded secret unauthorized subcontracting, in other words, illegal subcontracting. It's barely even penalized, just two points, the minimal penalty. In other words, the Indian supplier that hired this subcontractor has been penalized just two points. This is all quite embarrassing for Inditex, wouldn't you agree? The week after our first meeting in Madrid, the group finally agrees to an interview at Zara France's headquarters in Paris. Our crew is there, of course, and come all the way, especially from Spain, Felix Poza Peña, Inditex's Mr. Clean, the director of the company's social responsibility. But he didn't come alone. In his wake, is the CEO of Zara France, followed by two crisis communications specialists and Inditex's head of communication. Oh yes, the young chap in jeans is our sound engineer. Okay. Okay, the meeting will be closely monitored. Like us, they set up their own camera to record the entire interview. Everyone rolling? Let's start. Well, we have a report that comes from your services, which comes directly from Inditex. It was drawn up in 2009 in New Delhi, India, where you appraised 24 official suppliers of Inditex. We will look at what it says together, because it is quite staggering. Because by your own standards, the 24 suppliers that were audited at the time all were given a D, as seen everywhere in this diagram, and D is the worst rating you can give to a supplier. I think the basic philosophy of this report 
And actually, I don't know how it got into your hands because it was an internal presentation. Anyway, uh, the aim was precisely to highlight the problems amongst our suppliers, to review each of these suppliers and identify their problems and then set up with them a specific timetable in which each supplier is committed to fix this or that problem. That's what we do. This is an example of good practice, not the reverse. But there is a lot to fix here. You agree, don't you? 24 suppliers, 24 Ds. So that means everything needs correcting. It means there is a child labor in virtually all businesses and suppliers. There's problems with wages, scheduling problems, hygiene problems. So when you look at it, there's so much to fix. Yes, exactly. As I have said, we are very vigilant and we actively monitor our supply chain. And when we encounter a problem like the ones you've mentioned, we take corrective action. Our attitude is that zero risk does not exist. So when we detect a problem, we investigate and fix it, whatever it may be. And we have, in fact, changed the attitude of the Indian suppliers. So of the 24 providers who were classified D in 2009, how many are classified A today? Well, listen, offhand, I don't know, but uh, in any case, none are still ranked as Ds of that, I'm sure. We dropped three who had not kept their commitments to the remedial action that we put in place with them and who didn't want to follow our direction. We dropped uh, four others for commercial reasons and therefore we are currently still working with 17 of the original 24. But when you look at the report a little more closely, you can see something else. That these 24 producers, all suppliers to Inditex, then subcontract with 2,000 other companies. So right now we see this kind of spider's web of suppliers who work for you because they do ultimately work for the Inditex group, right? How can you objectively monitor 2,000 subcontractors in New Delhi? It also means there are probably 2,000 others elsewhere in India. But in New Delhi alone, there are at least 2,000. You're talking about subcontractors, right? Yes, yes, subcontractors. And we are able to tell that among your subcontractors, and you've conducted your own investigation into the subcontractors, it shows that in 25% of cases there was child labor involved. No, no, what we wanted to show here was that the suppliers were subcontracting without our group's knowledge, without us having authorized their subcontractors. So we investigated the origins of this outsourcing. And as we have done in recent years, we worked directly with our suppliers to increase their production capacity. Well, I want to show you another document because it's very interesting. It's a document that you also should know well. It's precisely when you try to change things in those businesses. It's like a scale, like this, with points, and the system is quite simple. The more serious the offence, the more penalty points are awarded to the factories at fault. And what is striking to us is that when one of your suppliers doesn't declare a subcontractor, it's worth two points. In other words, a minor sanction, really minor. I don't know where you got this either, uh, because this is a scale we use for our, our own management. I don't know who gave it to you. In any case, it's not from our department. And that's really not the issue, but it does come from Inditex. Okay, but here you're talking about something very specific, about subcontracting, that we are not told about. No, 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 it's not. Now listen, what we need to do, I want to emphasize one thing. Our policy is zero tolerance, regardless of whatever the infraction of our code of conduct. But when you say it's zero tolerance, frankly, it's hard to believe, because from our point of view, you've never sent them a message that says zero tolerance. That's a personal opinion. But look, this is a scale that comes from your services. It's not a personal opinion, it's a question of numbers. It's clear, child labor, 76 points, unauthorized subcontractor, two points. It's almost an incentive to take on subcontractors who will be Ds and who make children work. 
I think you're making an inaccurate comparison. An undeclared subcontractor may have a factory where working conditions are good or adequate, or maybe not. We make sure the supplier tells us that it's subcontracting. And when we identify who these subcontractors are, we visit them to check the working conditions for their employees. We focus on problem solving. This is our primary motivation, risk prevention. Look, where I don't agree with you is, is when you say that you do everything to encourage them to talk about their subcontractors. And frankly, threatening a penalty of just two points is not doing everything to ensure they tell you about their work with subcontractors. Well, you don't agree with me. That's a shame. I believe there are risks involved with outsourcing, but there's also a need to see exactly what working conditions are like at the subcontractors. As I've said, our policy is zero tolerance, but zero risk itself does not exist. Okay. Okay. Okay, so to recap, there are no problems in Inditex world. The New Delhi incident in 2009 is just a bad memory. The crisis communications expert is in front of the camera and everything is under control. That's the official version anyway, but we get the feeling we have ruffled a few feathers. Uh, one day you will tell me how do you have this information. No, no, never. Yeah, I suppose. It's maybe the reason why, nine days later, a last confidential document reaches us. This time it's no mystery. It's from the group's lawyers. Inside a letter that actively encourages us to cover how Inditex has made progress in New Delhi. There's also a corrected chart showing the current 17 suppliers with higher grades. None of them, in fact, had Ds any longer. And there's also some bonus video filmed at four of their best-ranked suppliers. So today we are at Milu Creations. We'll just see uh, this factory today, how it's going to work, how it was there before and what all changes they have done since last few years in this factory. The videos show four gleaming factories, impeccably clean, with state-of-the-art fire alarm systems, including a small hammer to break the glass. There are cupboards full of medicine in the infirmary. In short, up to norm, clean and airy. Little information, however, on the subcontractors used by the official suppliers, all those thousands of small blue dots, if you recall. So as a last check, as part of our investigation, it's to south of New Delhi, where we decide to visit one of them, again pretending to be buyers from France. This is one of the declared subcontractors, therefore checked out by Inditex. And yet, to our very faces, the manager admits he violates the rules set by the Spanish company. What time you start in the morning? What time? Nine a.m. And you end? Nine a.m. Okay. How, how many hours a week you can work in the factory? We work every day. Every day? Sunday only 9 to 4 p.m. Sunday off? 4 p.m. It's 20, one of seven days a week is, day. production is continuing. You have this other question about the overtime payment actually. Yeah, overtime. Not double pay. We are not paid. You're doing single for overtime? Yes, ma'am. At this Inditex-accredited manufacturer, the staff works far longer than the officially permitted 60 hours, with no day off once a week, no overtime bonuses. It's one of the perks of being a subcontractor, says the boss. It's easier, to, you're saying, yeah. contractor requirement those requirements are on the contractor but not on the subcontractor, you're saying. There are more restrictions for them than for us. Actually, when the people from Inditex come, we don't tell them we work overtime, and they never bother to check anyway. Of course, they're fully aware of it. They know. Conclusion. Dear Mr. Inditex, in response to your correspondence, the cash team would like to present you with this short video. It will allow you to maybe understand it's still possible to improve your controls so that one day you can achieve your goal of zero risk.
At the end of our six-month odyssey through the world of textiles, the moral of our investigation is that possibly the best way of doing low cost is to never fully examine to see what lies beneath the label. That way, you can continue to lower production costs and be able to clothe ourselves at highly competitive prices. As we stare at the contents of our cupboards each morning, our own responsibility seems purely relative. Oh, and P.S. We are, after all, all of us a bit scared to see the faces of those little workers that make our clothes, aren't we?